Bartender Brenton, hey, hello. Hi. Oh, I tell you what, I'm so glad to finally be at this bar. I've 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 had so many podcasts, but I, I know it's only nine a.m. But I want you to serve me another podcast. Give me a fresh Joe Rogan. Nathan. Yeah. Nathan. Yeah. You look like you're a man that has consumed one too many podcasts, and really, you should be consuming some coffee right now. So, yeah. I'm just giving you this advice, and and say so you should probably just go on your way. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a good little customer. I listen to every episode y'all want to be served now, bartender Brenton. Look, to be honest, I don't care what you do. So this one, the Joe Rogan's on me. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, alcoholism. Hello, Brenton. How are you doing? Yeah, I know. Making light of alcoholism, which uh, is a real world problem, you know. But uh, but here we are. Here we <laughs> are. Here we are fun. at Classic that's Movie the, Banter. That, that's the fun we get up to on Classic Movie Banter. You know, <laughs> that podcast where we review movies that are 20 years or older. Mm. And uh, we, we throw in some banter in there for some good measure. And we tell you whether they're worth your time still, these yes. classics. Or whether are they they're good? not, you know. Yeah, are they good? Are they, are they good? shit? Do the classics hold up, Brenton? You know, I want to listen to bloody Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and know if it stands the test of time. Exactly. You'll have to go and listen to classical music banter to oh, to get our sister get your fix podcast. On that regard. Like, yeah, yeah. Could you, <laughs> could you imagine? I would be so pretentious. We're like, oh, I really think actually his fourth movement with the fugues is actually the best of the five. Like, oh my gosh, that'd be so funny. Can we please do it? That'd be so great. Wait, isn't that what's that old movie about? Isn't it Amadeus? Amadeus, yeah, we're gonna watch it at some stage. I hope. And, we'll, and we'll do classic movie, <laughs> classic music, movie banter. That's what we'll do. Yeah, that sounds good. Classical, classic, classic, classical music banter. I love it. And we'll have like, we'll have like interludes where like between each segment we'll just have like an extract of one of his symphonies, and we'll be like, oh, no, can we talk like bloody ABC Radio? You know, and you know Australia reference. Ah, uh, you know yes. How- you know, like ABC Classic Radio. I do know ABC Classic Radio. I don't know if you listen to it because my grandparents listen to it avidly. Do yours? Uh no, no, no. My my grandma oh. does not listen avidly to that. But like, that's okay. I still I still have heard it before, so I understand. Can we the pretend to be. Do you know the Do you know the radio announcers on that channel? Not particularly. Like they always like, like when they announce voices. a new song. When they announce a new song, it, they're like, and that was Ludwig van Ho. Like, no, they said like, and that was Vivaldi's Somerset Symphony. Welcome back to ABC Radio. You are listening to an Australian station. And now but, but we you're, yeah. You're giving it too much inflection. It's just got to be like deadpan like on one note. It's like That's true. That was Beethoven's Sixth Symphony and welcome to back to ABC Radio where it, we are looking at the <laughs> classics that are great. And make us feel giddy and joyful. I just want to be in that recording booth because uh, you and I, when we when we record in my bedroom, we're we're having a jolly good time. We're, we're rocking about. Frankly, you can't keep us still. We're just we're actually playing ping pong as we record, Brenton. I don't know how the listeners haven't noticed by now, but yeah, Nathan is creaming my ass. It's like it's incredible. Like he's just smashing me. At ping pong. <laughs> Quite literally. Do you know how hard it is to record a podcast and play ping pong at the exact same time and edit out? Well, every now I do. Bounce? Now I do. Like it's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah, we're actually practicing for the Chinese championship. It's going to hard cut. For, to, like to us at Forrest Gump you know when he like for some reason represents the US in like ping pong in China yeah totally yeah. Uh, speaking of hard cuts hey episode hey. 57 yeah we're here uh, <laughs> we're talking we're talking about something like we were saying this before we started the show actually that mm. we haven't actually sat back and watched a real indie film in a while like it's something been that's, a while uh, yeah that's something that was a lot smaller like I think we both said that the last one was probably uh, before before sunrise. Yeah, which was like uh, in our twenties or something like that, wasn't it? Gosh, yeah, we yeah, were it was young like men ages ago. I'm trying to think because, yeah. like, I mean, obviously, you, you could count Pokemon the first movie as an indie film. Like, <laughs> I mean, I guess, but you know, yeah, but it's been a while. Maybe Annie Hall. I guess Annie Hall could count. You could really honestly say Mad Max was an indie film. To a certain extent. That's also like, true. Actually, also, like, The Castle. Was... Oh, yeah, that fucking Actually, thing. We, we may have done several indie films, but it's <laughs> still Nathan's been a mom. while. <laughs> it's Brenton's favourite movie, The Castle. So here we are doing Leave in Las Vegas. Yeah. Brenton, have you heard of this movie before? Has this been on your radar? No, it hasn't been on my radar at all. The only thing I knew about this movie was that it is the film that Nicolas Cage won his coveted Oscar for. So, yeah. you know, I couldn't say no to this. No, goodness no. And like, it's funny, I don't think we, we haven't done a Nicolas Cage movie, which we'll soon find out why. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I, I've had this on my list for years to watch. And like, <laughs> when when you and I finally bloody finished um, last week's episode, I'm like, I need some Nicolas Cage to bloody cleanse my palate 
of um <laughs> of the bloody um uh babe and babe 2 mess that we walked ourselves into to go from babe and babe 2 to leaving las vegas you could not walk further on the spectrum all right well nathan i have a question for you then oh what is that question brenton could you please pitch me leaving las vegas Okay, so we're back in the world of Babe 2. We're in this dark city, and the animals have left, and this may be the sequel to Babe 2 that we all wanted. No, no, that's not the case. All right. <laughs> Welcome to 1995. We're in the Hollywood studio, and um, up-and-coming actor Nick Cage. Brenton, I reckon we got to give him his own movie, this meaty role from To Really Sink His Teeth In. And what better story to tell than Leaving Las Vegas? It's a, it's a heavy drama. It's a very sad and depressing film that I want to make. It's about Nicolas Cage playing an alcoholic version of Nicolas Cage which if you've seen if you've seen his personal arrest history then maybe it is Nicolas Cage we'll find out but it's it's Nicolas Cage he's a Hollywood screenwriter and he's it is you know down on his luck he 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 loves the bottle you know he 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 loves to shop for booze and drink booze 24/7 so he ends up you know kind of pissing away his work life and just going to Vegas and just wants to drink himself to death but on the way to the highway to hell he he encounters this woman called Sarah who is um a sex worker in Vegas and she befriends him and they uh they encounter romance Brenton and maybe she convinces him or attempts to convince him that there's more to life than the bottle or maybe she just says hey keep on going with that bottle you know you you do you and it's a it's a tragic tale about man's addiction to alcohol in a city that is also about alcohol it's leaving las vegas okay that was a good pitch. Well done. I Thank thought you. that was a, a solid pitch. I res- mad respect for Nathan. It's so rudimentary to pitch. Like it's it's a very yeah. There's there's not much to pitch if that was if that makes sense. That is that is uh like I mean like there's the premise and then there's mm-hmm. just you can just pitch Nicolas Cage's performance I guess. But uh let's let's get into this get into this film. Yes. Leaving Las Vegas. Um I'm gonna say rip the bandaid off and I'm gonna say that I really like this movie. Hmm. Mm. I I really like this movie. I think this is movie is extremely dark. It is like <laughs> potentially potentially one of the darkest films we've covered on this show. Oh um, yeah, even darker than Babe Two, one would say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's debatable. But I um, was waiting for the sex worker to have a dog, and it would be the pink poodle from Babe Two. Oh shit! Oh no! Anyway, sorry. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh no! Um, I. Uh, yeah, I, I think this movie... Oh my god, that extreme- makes so much sense for that... Sorry, Babe 2 tangent, but it no, makes no, so much going. sense for Babe 2 to be set in Las Vegas. Because in the real Las Vegas, they've recreated most of the world's landmarks. I just realised that. Because they have the bloody pyramids and the Eiffel Tower and all that shit. Babe 2 could be set in Vegas. I want to start a new show. I want to start a new podcast where we go into the theories of, <laughs> of random fucking movies and we start doing fan theories for like Babe, for Shrek, you know, we just we just go into it, you know? Like we just we, watch these movies we and we're like, this is this is what that's really actually going on. I'm sure it already exists. I'm sure you can Google it. There's someone who, there's some idiots who but already Nathan, do as that. it is as it is, like people can't get enough of our content, so we might as well just like <laughs> Oh. Go all out and just Some have <laughs> argued there's too much, Brenton, but here we are to say there's <laughs> not enough. <laughs> so leaving Las Vegas. Yes, uh, this movie. So so it's it's extremely dark. It's it's it's, it's so sad, sad depressing you're movie. Just, you're and just sitting there going, God, the world's just horrible for Nick Cage. Like you, you're literally you're literally watching a scenario that you know has no possible happy ending. No, no possible Yet at the same moment, I think this movie is worth watching, and I think there's things to like gain gain from this movie. Funnily enough, and there's some real human moments in this movie um, that are great. In terms of like, it is a film though. Like in terms of like, let's let's talk technically in terms of directing, uh, mm. cinematography, editing. It's not setting the world on fire it's not it's no. not something and that's, that's the weirdest thing because you got these two outstanding lead performances right like it's carried by nick cage and i'm so sorry what's the actress's name i forget oh it it's is, something we should we should know the name it I know is, character's Eliz- name. sorry Eliz- elizabeth i was gonna say elizabeth uh but it is it's elizabeth shoe okay S-H-U-E. elizabeth shoe okay i don't know if that's how you print yep we're gonna call her miss shoe 
All right. Well, she like the two of them. They're giving like <laughs> they give they're giving like like the, they're really putting their all in both these performances. And the movie kind of just focuses on these two characters. There aren't really any characters outside these two that really stick around. So like. Um, except for one no. character, which we'll get to early uh, in, early on in the film, but like, so it's mainly these two, and like, it, you have these amazing character-driven performances, and yet the directing and yeah, and everything else is just so by the books, if that makes sense. Like, it, it's it's like it's like biopic directing, you know, like just standard biopic stuff. There was one scene. There was one scene that had something going on, and it was a it was a slow. It was a um. Oh, what was that? I think it was a dolly actually, and it um, it was going along, and it viewed the character, and it was so, it was so, it wasn't subtle in terms of its symbolism. Let's say, yeah, it had both of the characters coming up an escalator, continuing to walk along, and then Nicolas Cage's character, um, by by accident, um, due to his goes drunk, down the next one, bub, like yeah. Goes down the escalator and she keeps walking along the the top. Like it was like I'm it was like, it was wow. quite overt with its symbolism. But like, what but it was, that metaphor, was the one moment like. in the film that I was like, hey, that's a that that's a shot that I was like, hey, that had some thought put into it. And that was not. I'm not saying sorry. I'm not saying that all the shots didn't have thought put into them. I'm just saying that was a bit more creative than the than some of the cinematography and editing that we had before. Yeah, this this movie loves its slow motion, doesn't it, Brenton? And it loves its bloody freeze frames and it its does, fade to it blacks. Does. It's like, I don't know what Mike, whatever this guy's name is, who directed it. Like he got nominated for an Oscar for it, so apparently he did. He got nominated for two. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he got nominated for two directing and uh, screen screenplay. No, I don't think it was pitch up. Yeah. Yeah, and like it is well written. What I think I think it's a great screenplay. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a really. Strong, I think it might be a better um, screenplay, screenplay than movie, if that makes sense. I get where you're coming from. Um, mm. I understand your point, but I think at the same time, I think that these actors still bring uh, and endow these characters to life in a way that only they could. So it's worth it's worth it for that. Yeah, yeah. Brenton, what do you think of Nicolas Cage's performance? Because like the whole time I was watching this movie, I kept on asking myself, "Is this a great performance? Is Nicolas Cage a good actor, or is he just being himself?" Because honestly, I just cannot tell. Okay, so he he was my he's my journey with the film. Mm-hmm. Movie starts and I get bonkers Nicolas Cage. Like what an opening shot, by the like way. Immediately, of, like immediately, like... of him walking down the down the uh, down the um aisle, like at the bottle shop, like just like filling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, all right, that's, that's I had no idea what this movie was about going into it as well. I oh, really? You went in blind? I had, nice. I had no clue what I was watching. Oh, wow. I was like, okay. So, so, you know, that's kind of sets the scene. And I'm watching this in the first probably five minutes of the film. I was um, I was thinking, oh, here he is. He's at it again. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> He's back in the he, habit. And then there was something, and I can't, I can't actually pinpoint the moment where I clicked. And I was, and I, I started thinking... This is a really intense and solid performance um, mm. that is that is quite. Let's say re- I hate to use the word realistic because you know, um, but it's 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 relatable to a sense in, in terms of um, alcoholism and um, uh, someone that is broken and is and is on the very steep descent. Mm. Um, so I think I think it's I think it's actually a really solid performance. Um, yes. Whether whether it's like the most Oscar worthy thing I've ever seen in my life, like gosh, I'd need to watch it again. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Because we, we but, um, you and I both just watched this, so it's still very fresh in our minds. Like, but exactly. Like, um, but continuing on from that point, um, for me, this isn't Nicolas Cage's movie. It's Elizabeth Shoes. Like um, that was my biggest surprise too. Hundred percent. I yeah. thought she had way much more to do than Nicolas Cage did. Because like, because he's just, he's kind of like the Jack Sparrow of the film. He's just kind of like goofing about, spitting off weird shit as an alcoholic, and you feel for him because obviously he's going through a very serious thing. But she's just like she's kind of like us. Like she like she's the aud- sur- audience surrogate, and we kind of have to like deal with Nick Cage through her. And she re- and for the sex worker who sees this va- man so vulnerable and she's so vulnerable, I think she intelligently acts her way through this complex relationship. Oh, I don't know if she it's intelligently. I think I think she's as broken as he, he is to a certain extent and I think that mm. the, the I think what really attracts me about that character is holy shit, here it comes. It's that she's so fucking complicated. It's like yeah. there's layers and layers of shit that she's going through in terms of like having this uh, let's uh, because she he starts off as her uh, uh, has, as her client, and then to have feelings for that person, 
uh, who as a as a sex worker, like she admits, like that is just not on. Like it's not something. She, it's kind of something that she's removed herself from to start having feelings towards someone, then to like progress in this relationship where the person you're with is like very honest about what their goal is in life and is, and that is yeah. to like end their life. Like it's fucked up. Like it's, it's so it's, fucked up. And when he like, like blatantly tells her like I'm here to kill myself, she's like. Okay, and then she's like, so do you want head now? Like, <laughs> it's kind of funny seeing, like, the two of them, like, try and balance each other because they're both so messed up. Um, I thought... But they've got great chemistry, too, which... Oh, great chemistry. No, like, 100% they sells work the movie. really well it's, together, yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like the opposite of Before Sunrise, where, like, the character, where the whole movie's built on this one relationship. But, like, rather than, like, romantically walking around, like, Vienna, instead they're just, like, just, like, stumbling through Las Vegas, just being like, shit. It wouldn't really surprise me. For a film called Leaving Las Vegas, yeah. we'll talk about this more in title talk, but Vegas itself wasn't that prevalent in the movie. Like, like... They happened like they went to casinos and like you would see the flashing lights, but at the end of the day, like Vegas wasn't integral to either of their characters' behavior. If that made sense, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I was surprised totally. by that. Yeah, but like I do. What do you think about the juxtaposition of Vegas and the jazz music soundtrack? I didn't mind it. I actually thought the soundtrack was um, wasn't bad. I just thought I thought there was... are some scenes where maybe jazz music wasn't appropriate. There was some there were some scenes definitely that I wanted silence. Um and yeah. I think and it was it was more <laughs> But the director's like, Oh my gosh, act. we got Sting to do this soundtrack. We're so excited. <laughs> Every scene It was it was like it was we were coming into the third act and I thought, this is becoming a little repetitive and it's not because it's not good and it's not suiting the scene. It's just because because I've heard so much of this and mm. because these moments are so heightened in sense of what's going on, like I just want no sound. I, I don't want any music yeah. right now. Like, I just... 100%. I, I want to watch. So, I think that's probably more down to editing, if anything. Like, it could have been edited a lot better in that regard. Yeah, totally. I'd agree with that. 100%. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think it's a deal breaker. I think what may hurt people coming into this is that I didn't think there was that much story to the movie. Like, at the end of the day, there's very few narrative beats that it flows through. It's more kind of like just the conversations with, like, Nick Cage and his girlfriend. Yeah, it's like a couple study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like a fucked up couple study. Like, one where this yeah, chick looks yeah. like Kate Mara and she's just like, Nicolas Cage, you gotta... You know what surprise... Actually, no, that's probably more spoiler, but the things I actually talk about surprise me a lot in this movie. It, 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 I feel like they are cliche characters to an extent, like the drunk and then, like, the sex worker, but I feel like they do do interesting things with these tropes. Totally, totally. How insane is it at the beginning of this film that we have like a fifteen minute prologue before we get? Yeah, like the, by the time I was like, the the, title? when Nicolas Cage came up, like, like twenty minutes into the movie, I'm like, excuse me, <laughs> like what? And I was like, I I was I paused it and I was literally like, what? <laughs> like, and then I looked really? at the time; it was like I think it was fifteen or seventeen minutes, and I was just yeah, like, something like that. What? <laughs> Yeah. Also, Insane. side note, yeah. I know we talk about um, how shitty some posters can be. I didn't like the font for the... T- I know this is such a nitpick, but I wasn't a fan of the font for the movie. It was... Oh, look, I, I it don't It looked really like have shitty a... early 2000s clip art. Like, like you know, like the word art you'd put in Microsoft Word documents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked like yeah. some shitty, like... I mean, this was 1995, I'm pretty sure. It, actually, there you go. Then maybe it was. Maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> They just, I mean, they just did have used that back in the day. Uh. Like you get the point of it with the whole glittery thing, but I'm like, this looks cheap. I'm like, even though the film was made for like four million, I'm like, come on, like <laughs> you can do a little bit better than that. <laughs> uh, I mean, each into their own. <laughs> yeah, each to their own. I think what also may be detrimental to people watching this movie is that there's this weird subplot with like the sex worker and some Latvian pimp that kind of goes nowhere. Yeah, for me, it was really interesting because in the in the credits at the end, like there's like the main cast, and before they they do a um, alphabetical order of like everyone that's in the film, but the three mm. main characters are obviously Nick Cage, uh, Elizabeth Sh- Elizabeth Shue, and then this Latvian guy and it's like he's not yeah. he doesn't have that much screen time and I understand kind of because it sets her character's let's say backstory up he's there for like exposition but it's not like it's not something that's really I wouldn't even say it's a subplot it's not even like integral to the film at it's, all it's no not you could cut plot. that shit just, out and I think they should have frankly I mean I don't mind it I think I think it's a I think it's a I think it, it's good that it sets up to a certain extent that because for me, it's like, the if it wasn't in the film, I'd be asking the question of why is this character um, accommodating this clearly 
this man who's in a steep descent and like like how does how does she kind of like how does someone like that go for someone like him at the same time does that make sense like kind and of it's, uh, and it's so it's interesting to juxtapose Nicholas as fucked up as Nick Cage's character uh, is to like yeah. how fucked up in a way this Latvian guy is as well and like she just loves fucked up dudes that's the way she operates so like I don't think oh I don't think she loves the Latvian guy at all oh but no I no think no and yeah. you know there's some things you see with him that's quite disturbing but like yeah yeah this film definitely goes for the shock value like there is nudity and there is drugs but it's not as prevalent as you would think. No. no, no, gosh, no, gosh, no. There's there's booze as well, but like some of the points in this <laughs> yeah. movie, they, it's very adult. Like y- you know, like oh yeah, nudity, the same for your, ooh, your uh, kiddies or your grand nudity ooh, R rating. But there are plot points in this film that are like extremely serious, and I think it actually handled it with um, some tact as well. I thought that yeah, um, with some artistic yeah, flex. like when you do finally see the nudity, it's used very efficiently. If that makes sense, like. You know, they aren't, they, aren't, mm. they aren't Game of Thrones in it. They aren't just, like, being adult for the sake of being adult, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so in saying that, it's not we're not getting all these things, like, splashed all over the screen all the time. It's very precise in terms of... And again, it comes back to the screenplay of, like, when these moments are, and it's more about how these things affect the characters, which I appreciate. So do you want to rate this movie, Brenton? Yeah, dude. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm going to give this a thumbs up. I think it's um, I think it's good. Could you imagine coming home at the end of work on a Thursday night and you're like, let's put on leaving. Like, you're, you're tired from work, you're depressed, and you put on leaving Las Vegas. Yeah. And like, oh, geez, like, I guess my life isn't that bad then. Like, <laughs> Look, it, it depends on the person. But and I actually, I thought hard about this too because I was thinking, mm. again, like, because we're rating it off, like, Thursday night, you're, you're sitting down, you want to watch a film. And I think, like, even though... Like this isn't a jolly good time. It's not. But it's it's so depressing. Like. But but it's but it's something worth watching in the sense of. It's it's so it's it's something that you, well, like in some ways you can relate to, and I think it's just a very human, uh, film, and also like it's it's elevated to a certain extent as well because this scenario is just so fucked up that you mm. kind of want to see where this where this where this thing goes and get to know these people. Um, yeah, although in yeah. saying that, I wouldn't watch this for a romance story. I would no, watch God. this because... No, no, no. God, no. Because there are way better romance movies or, or, or just movies on relationships. I feel like the, the sole point of this is how alcoholism affects a relationship. I think that's... I think you go into... The, I think this is probably the best movie on alcoholism I've ever seen. The, the, I would agree. The, I, I would agree, but I, I don't even know if it's about alcoholism, though, Nathan, for me. It's about... Are you... The, what the fuck? What are you on? Of course it's about alcoholism. That's like the central tenant of the movie. I mean, it's one of them, I would say. What are the other ones? Like... Prostitution? You know, oh, yes, true. Prostitution. How, how, how negative relationships can um, affect affect people and i don't even mean necessarily their main relationship i mean like their backstories and how like where these people have like ended up in life is pretty mm. fucking actually horrible. trauma and trauma, like i think is important in this one as well yes exactly exactly yeah um yeah exactly nathan um there so for go. me it's more it's more about an amalgamation it's not just an a film on alcoholism even though i yeah. think as that part of the film like you said i think it's one of the best films that shows that yeah the last time i saw a film this good on alcoholism was probably who's afraid of virginia wolf where have you have you seen that i have seen that and i yeah. would agree with that yeah um, well you just see like the wife just like throwing alcohol <laughs> in like all directions i'm like that's probably the closest you've come to this i reckon she and nick cage would have a good time <laughs> bloody <laughs> elizabeth taylor and nick cage hanging out that'd be great oh have you foodie. seen um have you seen Warrior with um, Joel Edgerton and Tom Hardy? No, and you keep mentioning it, and I keep on saying I'm going to watch it, and it's embarrassing that I haven't, because it, apparently it is amazing, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, I just think that's got a quite a good representation of alcoholism as well, because one of the mm. characters in that um, is affected deeply by it, and it's one of those performances that you're just like, holy shit. Is isn't that- Mickey Rourke an alcoholic in one of these films? Uh, in is which it, film? In The Fighter? Is he an alcoholic in The Fighter? No, no. Mickey oh. Rourke isn't in... in, in I, Mickey, I think you're thinking of The Wrestler, which I haven't seen. Maybe, yeah. I know Mickey Rourke does a good alcoholic sportsman at one point. Yeah, which he was like nominated for awards and stuff, and it was the yeah. he was the hot topic of that year. And then I think Sean Penn beat him in Milk from memory, actually. Yeah, uh, don't quote me on that. Though. Hey, uh, what about Oscar. what about um Paulie from the Rocky films? <laughs> But no, like God, uh, you know, you know, you know. If all I've learnt from the Rocky films and alcoholism is that, like, hey, be a fucking asshole and things will work out. You'll be, you'll become a boxing trainer and you'll be given a robot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
So yeah, Brandon, I, I, I guess when you look at Nick Cage's <laughs> alcoholism <laughs> compared to everyone else's, I feel like definitely this is the most insightful out of all of them. And I love that it doesn't provide easy answers as well. Like it's it's like it's a no. complex issue. Also, it doesn't try to cure. The movie doesn't try to say this is how you fix alcoholism. It says just more this is how you address alcoholism, if anything. So I I, I yeah. really like it. And this is a very cynical movie, so you gotta go I think you gotta go in knowing it is a dark, sad, heavy movie, and you and you're going to come out of it with with something learned, but it's, you're going to have to go through hell to get there. If that makes sense. Sure, sure. So, yeah. No, I I think I think on the alcoholism alone for that lesson and seeing Nick Cage just run and shop, I'm going to give my thumb up too. Hey, hey. Oh, but only so just. Like, I'm not in love with this movie. I'm no, not like yeah. I don't think it's one of the great dramas or performances. I I would say that for me. You're a bit more on the fence, whereas I'm definitely like, yes. Like, You're strong. Thumbs up. I'll be interested to see in episode 60 where I sit in this in a few weeks. But I, I'm def- right now, I'm definitely giving you a thumbs up. I definitely think it's worth it for, for the alcohol. Yeah. Brenton, I, cool. I, I should I should, I should point out, I watched this film very hungover. Oh, gosh. Which no. was a moronic decision. <laughs> and Because I, I forgot just the way I was planning my life. Because last night, I had um, a friend's goodbye party. So, like, she was leaving the city. So, she, like, had invited a bunch of us to a bar. And we all said goodbye. And we all had a few mini beers. And then I woke up this morning and I put on this movie. And I'm like, oh, jeez. Like, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like... This is not what I need right now. But I, like, for, the, for oh, the podcast. <laughs> I, I was, like, I was like drinking some tea. And I'm just, like... I was watching this. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> like... like it opens like Nicolas Cage going through the shop and I'm like I can't, I can't do this so. <laughs> I, I was watching this film and I again I went into this I went blank slate I had no idea what it was about didn't know what I was getting myself into and before the film started I poured myself a glass of fucking wine <laughs> oh did you really <laughs> and oh I, no <laughs> I sit down to watch this and it opens and I'm like Mm. <laughs> and you look at the glass, you're like, "Oh no, <laughs> maybe the real villain is me." <laughs> exactly. So that was that was quite uh, meta. <laughs> oh god, I love it, Branton. What do you want to spoil about this movie? What <laughs> spoiler? Spoiling a depressing movie. The spoiling this movie. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's talk about this movie. Um, let's talk about. I'm just I always in spoiler section I just have to jump into like the big thing that's on my mind you, I love it and you, 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 you open with your biggest joke like I love it like, <laughs> dude this isn't a joke what the fuck how fuck Holy shit. Up is the last fucking like big scene of this film which is the first time I think I'm pretty sure that they make love this couple yeah that we see them make love proper like. on his deathbed yeah God, because you go through a lot of shit things in this movie, like rape, like fight, like all of this, but then it decides to end with him like fucking him to death, literally. It's insane, and it comes out of nowhere because he calls her and he's like, "Mrs. Shu, come over to my apartment. We're gonna we're, let's 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 build bridges." And then she comes over and then she just lies on top of him, and it's just silent. It's sad, and even even the way he dies, where you just see him like roll over after the sex, he's like, "Ugh." And he has like this little like dead face, and you're like. But also, she geez. comes into that room, and we we don't we don't like great great moment where you don't see him, and then like she opens those curtains, and he's like convulsed. I thought he like was going to be like, dead. I thought she was going to come into the dark room, turn on the lights, and we would have found his dead body. If that was fucked, like there was genuinely, that was dark. <laughs> I was oh, yeah, it was, I was so dark. But but at the same time, very it was right for the story. Like it was like <laughs> it was good to see him die. But, like. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I no, was so like, curious the whole film if they were going to be like, no, this let's cure Nick Cage eventually of alcoholism. Like, if it was going to be optimistic, but like, it, I, I respect the film more than it did. And they said no, that he came here to die, and he died. And like, and the whole film, he kept on saying, no, I'm here to die, and he bloody delivered. I, it was that thing of like twenty minutes in. I was thinking, oh, is he or will or not, or like, what is it going to go? And then after the twenty minutes, I, I kind of made up my mind that if it didn't like follow through on that, that like. I just think it would have been a. I think it would have been weak. I think it would have been so fucking weak for it not to do that. Oh. And obviously, like that's where that's where it's headed the whole time too. And so the film's pushing you in that direction. He's like he's he's like one of the only characters I know that that sets out on a goal and achieves <laughs> it. But the end of he's the, like bloody the Thanos, the mate. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> fucking hell. He's, he's out oh there to get God. some stones. You know, <laughs> bloody Nick. Ca- oh, but I would kill to see a Nick Cage do Thanos. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just like. <laughs> Destiny arrives. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Uh, but here's the thing: it didn't really surprise me that much that he died because the whole film is laced with these no. inter- 
these interviews that she does with her therapist or whoever it is. And so she keeps on talking about Nicolas Cage in the past tense. So during the movie, I thought, oh, he might have either one left Vegas, like the title suggested, or two, he's dead. And I always lend towards the latter because I thought there's no way this man's walking out of this destructive path like in good shape. No, no, God, no. And um, and again, like it raises that question for me that last, like that last big moment in the film of like, where does she go? Like, what does she do? Yeah, because she she gets... I was so upset when she got booted out of her apartment. I'm like, come on, this lady's been through hell. And, like, she's not that... It was the setup as well of, like, that the the landlord saw her, like, limping, like, back to her room. And you kind of... And you hear the knock on the door. Yeah, and you hear that knock on the door. And, like, part of me was thinking is, like, is she going to, like give out a give lend out a hand to this person mm. and then you're mm. just like get the fuck out by the end of the week and they just walk away and that and peace like, husband follows oh, her like is just like I love him he's always like holding shit. like the golf club or like the broom or some shit like that like <laughs> yeah. oh. it's like, you're in Las Vegas how can you have any stigma against like prostitutes by this point it's like you know what I mean it's I, I just don't get it you know it really actually you know what this reminds me a lot of Boogie Nights as far as like it's it's, it's yeah cool. totally yeah and, 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 and that's a big compliment, you know. I, I think it really addresses those things quite heavily. Um, yeah, I yeah. really fell for it when she got kicked out. Um, but, you know, this movie is serious, and there are a lot of serious things I want to chat about, but the, I, it does have some humour, somewhat. It's kind of black humour, because you're laughing at this yeah. kind of sad man. <laughs> I, there's some great moments with Nick Cage I do want to have a laugh at. One of my favourite moments with him was when he, you see him lining up in the bloody like DMV or whatever it is, about to, like... No, the bank, where he's going to, like... like get his check in and there's for some reason he's got like this bloody like like microphone recorder and he's like staring at this woman who he's fucked up talking to and he's looking at her from across the counter and he's like openly like writing this erotica kind of thing of what he wants to do with her and the way it's shot, I was always going to do this for the bloody steals this movie. But the way it's shot, it's like him holding. This I nearly, and- I nearly did too as well. So oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's so good. And you see like like four people in line at the bank, <laughs> and they're just watching him do this like speech. I know it's going to like fuck her and like do her in the ass all that kind of shit. Oh, it's so good. I actually, I honestly like. As fucked up as it is, I thought that was like what a like like I thought that was such a good monologue, dude. Like I was like, oh, he nailed it. He, could you imagine like? like was, uh, could you imagine auditioning for acting school and doing that monologue? It's a great monologue. Like it's it's it's, it's really, really good. You, yeah, it's really good. good. With it. Yeah. Um, and it's a great moment in the film too, and it's just. It's one of those because it's at the very beginning. Well, no, it's after the <laughs> it's after the title of the of the film, and it's like, <laughs> and it it just what it's one segue. of those things. It's one of those things that just kind of like like just sets up the character in a way that's just so succinct and to the point, mm. and and then links to like kind of the moment later in the film when they're at a pool. Uh, mm. They're like they go away for like a weekend or something, and they're at that's that right, motel, yeah, yeah. and uh, she she tries to. Let's get it on, and she does it, and she tries to arouse him by like Bum, pouring chow. fucking yeah bourbon, I think, on herself. Like, like yeah, we see yeah. her, I, we see her boobs for the first time, and we're yeah. like, yeah, and she's like pouring alcohol on herself. Like, yeah, this is sexy. I'm like, lady, you have no idea how sticky that's gonna be. But then, like, they just start like hooking up, and then like again, it, it's very fucked up. Like, it's, it is very it's, fucked up. Oh, They're a fuck. fucked up couple. It's very Bonnie and Clyde, isn't it? Like, if Bonnie and Clyde were alcoholics, like. But then that leads me onto another point that I wanted to bring up, which I is, think I know what you're gonna talk just, about. Can we just talk about quotes from Nicolas Cage and specifically oh. the one that 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 got me there was one at the start that I can't quite remember that got me but this one got me and I just and it was the prickly pear line <laughs> It's so good. Oh, cuz in a script that would just be like such like a like a nothing line, but he he just augments it by tenfold, doesn't he? He takes an inch and runs a mile. That's the way that's the way oh, that that's that man Nick acts, Cage for you, know you know what I mean? Like like Oh, I love like, it when like oh he goes up to the bar and he's like bloody what does he say? He goes um he, he meets that chick that he's sitting on. He's like, "We must not kick the bar. We must lean into the bar." Like, <laughs> yeah. like next time I go out for drinks, I am five hundred percent using that line because it's so funny. Oh, like it's great. It's he's he's got he's got so many lines in this film. Oh. There's one at the start that I can't remember, and I sorry I brought it up without remembering it. No, but it's fine. Like, I, it's, you should watch this movie alone, or even just go on YouTube and just look up Nick Cage lines from. Leaving Las Vegas because they're so quotable. I'm surprised they're not bigger in pop culture because they're so funny. Like, oh, uh, I guess because it's so sad because he's a man dealing with like death and alcoholism. So that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. I I think it's more like because it was a smaller release and 
you know, even though it won the award and what he won the award and whatnot, I just think, you know, it's just one of those films that just hasn't like taken off. And like you said, it's because it's so fucking dark that it's yeah. like it's such an it's for such a not even a niche audience, but it's for an, a very adult audience. But I feel like and people would really get around this. Like it's I do a, too. There's a lot I do to too. dig out of it. I'm so glad we mentioned the pool thing before because there's two things from that moment that, that that scene that I really want to talk about. One, how the hell are they drinking booze under the water, man? Again. <laughs> Because there's a scene where, like, Nick Cage dives in. It reminds me, have you seen Breaking Bad? Of course. Okay, so it reminds me of that scene. Is it Skylar when she walks down to the bottom of the swimming pool? You know, where, like, there's one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's amazing. And she, she, it's like, I think it's in the last season, actually, and she walks out and she just, like, goes into the water. She walks down to the bottom of the pool and you think she's going to drown herself or whatever. It's very tense, that kind of stuff. And then Nick Cage does a similar thing where, like, he dives into the pool and he's down there a little bit too long. So, like... Mrs. Shu d- dives in and goes after him and then for some reason he's drinking under the water and he passes the bottle to her under the water and she drinks out of it too I'm like lady I don't- is this Aquaman are we are we not following the rules of water right now <laughs> <laughs> don't think about it just just watch the beautiful shot <laughs> but then but then my favourite side character in this whole movie rocks up at the end of this scene because they fucking smash the table oh. she sends Nick Cage in his way and this like and this woman who wa- works at this like, host- like hostel no hotel whatever it is, comes over and she's like oh she's like very sweet very mrs doubtfire she comes over she's like oh it's okay dearie like oh take care of this don't you worry a pity penny and and bloody um sarah's like oh thank you so much that's so kind of you because i'm happy to pay for the table i'll fix it it's all good but then this woman just fucking like rips into like sarah and she's so savage she's like you fucking come back here again i'll cut you like <laughs> she's it's <laughs> and she's saying it with such a sweet tone yeah and she says it with that fucking like fake ass like smile like yeah like a like an airplane hostess or something like oh shit dude it's like evil you're like oh shit i was like where, where, where the uh, fuck did this chick come from she's like because she opens it by saying like oh we when we're used to having losers here or something like that like or failures she took she she insults them and then she just fucking rips into her and like and sarah's just like looking at her going what the fuck she's, she's like get out of my motel she's like okay yeah it's it's pretty it's yeah, she's like, go back to your room with your fucking alcohol and your loved up fuckhead. Stay there the night. Check out in the morning. Um, don't talk to me again about this, and I never want to see you here again. Basically, yeah. and it's just and like, she's like, Whoa. okay. Next time I break up with someone, I'm going to quote that woman directly. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Please don't. They'll probably put a restraining order on you. They um, probably will. From my favorite side character, um, Brenton, to my least favorite side character. What's with the Latvian guy? Uh, well, elaborate, elaborate on that because uh, like, like I just don't a, get he, why he's in the movie. You know what he reminds me of so much? He reminds me of fucking twins and the gangster plot in that movie, where it's just there f- for no good reason. I would say it's not as intrusive as that. Like as it's it was not, in twins. No, God, no. It's it's there. It's there to kind of set the scene, and then it, it fucking goes away randomly when he's like, "Oh yeah, please, I don't want to see you yeah. again." Yeah, it just uh, randomly like then, sh- closes its own storyline off. Like it's really weird. Which I which I think he was like trying to protect it to a certain extent, like in a fucked mm. up way. And then like you see all these hitmen just like arrive in the hallway, and you're like, "What oh, the geez. fuck?" And then like we just but it's never, never brought up again. Yeah. Like she, you never see her deal with the trauma from that, or just like like you, you, like what is he? He like, he like knives her ass at one point or something like that, and she's not happy about that. Yeah, no, I think it's like the, I think I think it's a I think it's quite an abusive. Obviously, they've had like quite an abusive past, and he's obviously a pimp or whatever, and it's just not a good time. Mm, don't be, don't be around the Latvian pimp. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. I, know, I yeah. laughed then because I was because it's so horrible that it's like if I don't laugh I'll cry. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> oh, you got it. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite Nick Cage moment of joy, Brenton? My favorite Nick Cage moment of joy because he has a lot of happy faces and a lot of happy moments in these movie in this movie. I'll have to talk about mine in another section. Um, oh, if you okay. know what I mean. Or we, or we can can tra- we can transition to that now. Oh no no, like, no 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 no. Let's let, like uh, I'll talk about it later. Yeah yeah. Okay. No, I feel you. Very I, was, I was gonna I was gonna say <laughs> bloody the moment where he gets his presents. <laughs> you know she rocks up and he's like presents and he's like so happy. I'm like Fuck. no. He goes. <gasps> Presents. <laughs> Pre- he just like comes completely back to life. Like, it, like, it, like he's so funny to laugh at sometimes at these points in, the, in this movie. You're just like, because she, because she, because she's cause, like, throughout the film, she pulls the most concerned faces. Like when he, like, like when um she bloody um when he puts on her earrings for the first time, and she's like got this most like like conf- like, mm. f- like appalled face, and he Nick Cage is just like so happy and all that kind of stuff. Like, 
Like, I feel like his joy is contrasted very well against the darkness of this movie. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Which, again, mm. I think it's quite it's quite human. Like, it's quite, you know, normal people don't tend to, st- tend to dwell on their, like, darkness or whatever. They're, like, there to try and attempt to have a good time. Or seem like they're having a good time. Yeah. You know? Because it's, it's funny, because um, even though, like, he's being this weird, she she really tries to have a good time with him. Like, she accepts him for his alcoholism. That's the thing that surprised me the most. It took her yeah. so long to finally say, maybe give up the booze. Like, she's encouraging him to get drunk for so much of the movie, which I found shocking. Yeah. And I, I think uh, there's that turning point of... Uh, it's like... It's like... And it's the thing of, like, you know, when you, when you, I guess, love someone, it's like... Like, and genuinely love them, it's like, fucking hell, like... You don't want them, like, he's got four weeks or whatever he says he's going to do this in, and it's like, holy shit, like, to watch someone deteriorate to that level and encourage them, like, you have to be feel pretty fucking guilty and, you know, accountable mm. to that as well. And not only just that, but to see someone that like doing to that themselves every day, like, I don't know if I... I don't think I'd stay in a situ- I don't think most people would stay in a situation where, like, they'd be doing that to someone they loved. Like, fucking hell. Like, it's crazy. Oh, I'd be crazy. I 100%. 100% agree. Do you think... Because I, I don't think she's a good person for doing that, you know, for keeping him drunk. Like... No. I think she, she's morally no. skewed, which which is... Cause, cause I, so I didn't like her a little bit for that throughout the film. Like, come on, you've got to help Nick Cage. Don't just accept him. But then I merely built back empathy again after that horrible sequence near the end of the film where she gets raped and attacked and... And you know, by those, by those, like what college boys? I want to say, yeah, fucking terrible. Just that was like, horrible awful. to watch. That was um, really terrible. No, no. Well, I was going to say the same thing. It's that thing of like because you don't, you don't see the 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 event. Um, it's if it, it, there's flashbacks to it. Like we see her trauma first before you see like like it alludes to what's happened, and then we see uh, the aftermath of like her beaten face and. Um, her physically, like, after it, and also, like, you can see she's, like, emotionally, obviously, just, like, destroyed. But then we just have these horrible... The shower scene with the flashbacks. Oh, God. Oh, God. Like, terrible, 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 terrible. And then that's when they she gets evicted as well. But, yeah, that shower scene I thought was a really... Um, and it's a bit of a cliche, I guess, to use the shower as, like, the... Yeah. <laughs> like, like, come on, we've seen... The, you know... Oh. We've seen it a billion times. Like, there are a lot of cliches in this. But at the same time, it, again, like, the, the most of this movie, it's executed quite well, so, you know, and it did make you... It was confronting, and it made you, obviously, feel and empathise with this person just going through such a fucking traumatic experience. No, 100%. I 100% agree with that. And, like, and I, I, I just thought it escalated so quickly for her as well. Like, to this this trauma, because mm. she already had a lot of it. And then, like, because you meet these guys, and they kind of seem like good guys at the start. They seem like a little bit idiots. They're, like, filming on their bloody 90s video camera. and like, ah. From the start, I was like, no way. Get the fuck out of there. Like, these oh, kids yeah, are yeah. fucking... Sh- like, like, I was just like, radar. I was having I was none like, of I was it. like, are you yeah. really going to have your, like, mate lose his virginity vibe this way? It's like, this is kind of a shit way of losing it. And, like, you see the guy wasn't Dude, happy when- about it. And when he came out of the bathroom, I was like, oh, no. Like, I was just like, like, oh, no. no. (laughs) Like, get get out of there. Like, I don't know what his issue was. Like, he had issues, like, (laughs) clearly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, terrible. horrible. I actually had this thought. I actually actually had this thought that he was... uh, This is irrelevant, really. But, like, it's Mm. just what you read into something. It was like, for me, that he was, like... Uh, he'd like pre- repressed his sexuality, like he was like actually gay or something, and was like, trying yeah, to, like, convince I can definitely get that, that reading that, from that. that. Yeah, and that like he was trying to like re- like repress his sexuality and show that he was a man, and then he just mm. he just king hits her like it's and, horrible, yeah, and and just oh like terrible, yeah, it's horrible, absolutely horrible, yeah, and you know like. What made me really pay attention, what made me think, like, this movie was so smart with its alcoholism, Brenton, was that I really love that Nick Cage doesn't know how he became an alcoholic. Like, I thought that was really, really smart from the script point of view. It's almost like the Joker, you don't know where he comes from. Like, I love that Nicholas Cage is like, did my, did I get drunk because my wife left me, or did I drink because, you know... Or did she leave me because yeah, of the I drinking drank. or yeah. something? Like, yeah. I thought that was so smart. I was like, I love that. I love that this film doesn't explore how you become an alcoholic. It's like, no, he's an alcoholic, and let's just deal with it, you know? Did yeah. you ever think they were going to come back, the wife or the kid? No. Yeah. I no. thought it weird he had a kid and he never mentioned her, him as well. No, yeah. Um, sad. sad. It's so sad because he dies yeah. like after having sex with this, this this woman and then you just think, well, that child now lost his father. 
But he probably already lost his father the second he succumbed to the bottle. But it's so funny, like, rehab could have saved him. He wasn't, like, he was gone, but he wasn't, like, unsavable, you know? But the film just chose not to give him rehab. No, and, um, yeah, I think, like, obviously to help, like, to help someone, like, that person has to want to help themselves, like, first and foremost. And it's, like, you could just see that there was no revelation coming. There was no, um change from that course and the conflict that that character goes through is obviously it's a um direct um consequence of his his alcoholism but mm. also of his actions as well like the scene where he takes the pro- the other prostitute back to the to oh that was um, heartbreaking wasn't it yeah um so much of this film is that <laughs> Just heartbreaking, yeah. Just, you're just heartbreaking. Like, Fuck, yeah. All right, then, then let me talk about two funny things then before I wrap up my yeah. spoiler stuff. Sure. Two funny things I really laughed at in this movie was that there's one scene where, like, he's asking her out to dinner on the streets. If you remember the scene, and, like, he's like, oh, we should go get dinner. And it's, like, this one shot where you see them both in frame. And in the background, while he's asking her out, you see these nuns on the street. I don't know if you noticed this. Yes. And they're handing out... I fuck- think this was the scene... I think this was the scene after he sold the car. Is that correctly? Like she yeah, finds yeah, him yeah, on like, yeah. the bench, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And I love that there are nuns just on the streets of Vegas because <laughs> I've been to Vegas. You've been to Vegas too, haven't you? I've been to Vegas. Yeah, too, we yeah. both been to Vegas, and I don't remember seeing these nuns, but I love that they probably exist, and they're just handing out pamphlets for the church while like, <laughs> this like alcoholically rampant man is just like going. Whoa. I remember seeing those, and I remember thinking, "Well, that's a bit blatant, isn't it?" Like filmmaker, yeah. like come on, <laughs> like with Actually, you, yeah. with your, I, I, again, I, it was like one of those little, but I thought it was funny too. Yeah. No, no, I was, I, I was going to say, like, because we've both been to Vegas, how do you think this film represents Vegas, you know? I mean, we were both there as kids, so I think we saw a different version of the city. <laughs> that's that's the thing. Like, for me, like, I was there when I was a kid, so obviously mm. my experience, like, I didn't experience, obviously, any of this. Could you, like, could like, you imagine? <laughs> but, see, I could imagine your father, Brenton, being like, okay, everyone, we're going on a family holiday to Vegas, let's put on a Vegas film, and he, they put the bloody Leaving Las Vegas on, like, this is where we're going for holidays. Yeah, it doesn't, it, I, I, wa- I want to talk about more about the Vegas thing, actually, in title talk. Um, oh, okay. I have, I have a couple. Do you want to do it right now? 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 Let's fucking do it now. Let's do it, dude. Title Jumble talk. Jumble up the order. Yeah, let's do let's it. Leaving Las Vegas. Leaving Las Vegas. Okay, so what do you think of the title? Well, they don't bloody leave Las Vegas, do they, Brenton? I think they do. Oh, what? Because he dies and what his soul leave Vegas or whatever. No, I think I think for me it's like, well, yes, to a certain extent in <laughs> no, the literal but yes. sense. <laughs> but for me, it's like for me, it's like, and this is what I think they're trying to get at with the whole Las Vegas thing. It's like. You, he's literally gone to like the city of fun, like the city of mm. like, <laughs> like no responsibility, like fucking, ch- like just, um, awful, uh, very dirty but like raunchy fun. Like that is like Las Vegas, like summed up. Mm. And so for me, it's it's more symbolic. It's like the whole Las Vegas thing, like leaving Las Vegas. It's like it's like this guy is just like, and so is she to a certain extent. It's like leaving that it's it's like it's like accepting responsibility is what i think this like is trying to get at as well and which oh, okay. they both don't which no, they, they both don't. don't that's what i love they about don't. it and so flips like the character because like no fuck you they're exactly. both ending up miserable so, like. so for, and especially because it doesn't dwell on the las vegas thing i was like thinking about this title for ages and i think that it's getting at that more so than like the literal location you think yeah you think vegas is more metaphorical in the sense like, exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I I do like the phrase "leaving Las Vegas" as a nice ring to it. So as far as like a title itself goes, but for this movie, I don't know. I guess they wouldn't want to put because this film was marketed as a romance movie. Like they didn't really have like the heavy, yeah, thing, which I found bizarre. bizarre. But like, because I would imagine rocking up in the audience just being like, "What is this?" But like, I don't know. I wouldn't have wanted to put like 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 "Demon in a Bottle" as a title or anything like that. Like. I can't think of a better title, but at the same time, I the, I don't want people thinking this film's about Vegas because it's not. It just so happens to be in Vegas, you know. You could have yeah him go to a city with a prostitute in anywhere in America, frankly. So like, sure, yeah, yeah. I think it could have just been maybe like it, could, it should be called Leaving the Bottle or something like that. I think le- Leaving Las Vegas is like the more I do, um, thought about it, the more I thought it was a great title. So I'd leave it as it is. But um, I get your point though, like. You know, mm. it's there's a especially because Las Vegas is so iconic that obviously like it sets up a whole another side of things in your head. It's um, true. It's, it's good to have then, that brand recognition. But, but then again, maybe it's trying to undermine that and to also subvert that, I guess, to a certain extent. So I don't know. I don't know. Mm. You you let us know what you guys think. 
Yeah. So, Brenton, what steals this movie? Mate, i got a story for you. Let's go. <laughs> what steals this movie? This is the section of the podcast where uh, either Nathan or, or myself or both of us together, we select a still from a scene in this movie. Like, one still, one frame that we think is either funny, interesting, or... Um, Basically, it steals something that's the show, as it that, were. That's, yeah, there's something that's worth talking about. So let's talk about this one. Um, I oh, and if you want it. to see this picture, by the way, um, go to our YouTube channel. It's in um, the bloody picture. So if you want to look at that there, okay. but we'll describe it as we talk about it anyway. Okay. So at the very beginning of this film, before we get to the title, before we get to anything, it's in this opening thing setting up uh, Nick Cage's character. He's like, he's drinking in the car. He's fucking driving around town or whatever. And he pulls over and he sees the, and it, this prostitute uh, approaches the, the car mm. and she says, uh, she says something. Do you want this or that? Do you want to go out? Uh, do you want to take me out or something or go on a saucy date or something? And it hard cuts to this shit. It hard <laughs> cuts to Nick Cage like the most fucked up I've ever seen Nicolas Cage in my life with this <laughs> like happy grin like on this ang- odd like, angle like, like, the frame is like him oh. leaning out of the car and his eyes have got these huge red rings around him he looks like he can't even like make like eye. he's like trying to make it like in that whole shot he's like trying to make eye contact but he's kind of like they're going all over the place mm. and without any context of anything if you saw this it is the funniest thing you'll ever see <laughs> you would like, be horrified is, especially as a is, sex worker looking at this man you'd be like oh no money would make me sleep with this guy because he just looks like <laughs> he just looks stoned out of his mind where he's just he's got this shitty frizzly haircut <laughs> And he's just grinning like the Joker. And he's like, you can see he's like waving his head like a fucking bauble doll. And he just looks so out of it. And the, and the funny he's, thing is he's pointing this expression while driving a vehicle. And also, like the sound effect that would like sum up what I think what he's doing right now would just be like... <laughs> like oh my it's, goodness, it's just... Like he has, so, and it, 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 it's funny watching this movie. There were so many th- moments we could have chosen because, like, he just the whole movie is him pulling the stupidest faces, and yet this is just one of them, and it's so good. And this woman must have been terrified. The reason I picked this one though is because this happened at the very start of the film. I saw this, and it's very serious. Like, again, it's very dark. You're going, oh shit, this guy's fucked up like you know mm. uh, and there's that great moment as well where like he's the cop bike is like next to him and he's like nodding to the cop and the oh yeah and the like, cop's like should i pull this guy over and the cop's like nah <laughs> yeah yeah and then he like goes straight away a neck minute vodka bottle comes up but anyway <laughs> like, yeah. it's like it's but if like if you the reason i picked this one sorry was that this happened very serious that's just happened i'm like oh gosh and then it hard cuts to this and i like violently burst out laughing like because it was the funniest <laughs> the funniest thing I've ever seen gosh oh, so I laughed good. you will laugh in so this much movie. so that oh. so much so that someone else in the house was like what what what's that noise like what are you what you're like ugly laughing and I was like gosh I'm watching <laughs> and then I said gosh I'm I'm watching leaving Las Vegas and they were just like what like and that's your reaction to it like and i was like oh, no, it's like a- you monster like. <laughs> uh, so how did they make this brenton how did how did they make this making the movie yeah making this movie yeah magic well nicholas cage was that. made by mr <laughs> cage and mrs cage and they were very happy one day so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, the cabbage uh, patch. All right. <laughs> One of my favorite facts about this movie, Brenton, is um the research the actors had to do for this movie. Hmm. Do and, elaborate. Um, so so um so Nicolas Cage and um, Mrs. Shu were both encouraged to do um uh, a lot of research for their respective characters. So um Shu spent time interviewing several Las Vegas sex workers. You know, saying, "Okay, what's your lifestyle like? Or what are your mannerisms?" We're going to do some of these. Whereas Nicolas Cage, he flew to Dublin for two weeks and had and brought a friend with him and just had his friend film him for a fortnight just getting drunk in all these bars. And Nic- and Nicholas and Nicholas Cage later on said it was one of the most enjoyable pieces of research I've ever had to do for a part. Well, good on you, Nick Cage. I'm glad I'm glad that you you took the role on and you did your research and you and you went there and you experienced that. But just think, Nathan, those videos exist. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Like, you imagine like for the Oscar campaign, like Nicholas Cage is like, okay, this is what I did to get in the role. It's just like him, just like in fucking like Kalani, just being like, just like woo. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh gosh. Uh, hey Nathan, do you know that this is um uh, and I've, I've I've given this fact. I can't remember which film I gave this fact to as well. But this film is actually on the great uh, Roger Ebert's uh, great films list, like of the films oh, nice. that he's like, I I stand by this movie. I think there's like a hundred movies on the list or whatever, and this is on it. So it yeah, is, it's important. I think if you want to understand alcoholism, this is definitely important for that side of it. It was also included among the uh, American Film Institute's. Um, list of the 400 movies nominated for the top 100 greatest American movies. So it, Oh, fantastic. It's, there you go. It's, it's, it's up there, yeah. It's getting past in the backs, buddy. When they were making this movie, Brenton, so um, Figus is the guy who actually um, was the director. Mike Figus, I think his name was. And he had a lot of issues getting permits to actually film on the streets of Vegas because they had such a small budget. So what they did is that they just filmed it on the streets, but they without a permit. So to get around it, they would try and do as many one takes on the street as you can. So they could quickly run away if the oh police my came gosh. by. So that's why when they're on the streets, there are so many one takes because literally they had to like scram every time the cops would drive past. Isn't that just amazing? Like I know that making movies, dude. Like, oh. gosh, that's crazy. It's fantastic, isn't it? Good on them. So I don't know if you know this, but this film was actually based. Um, it's a adapted screenplay. It's based on a novel. I do know this. Yeah. Um, and it's a sad thought, story, actually. The, the it is a sad story. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go into it a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah go for it, dude. But the, but what I'm gonna start off. Oh no, I will, I'll say the sad part first, and that is um, uh, the author John O'Brien, um, on whose uh novel this movie is based, actually committed suicide two weeks after the movie went into production. Yeah. And they were so serious that like uh. Mike uh, Figgis, who wrote the adapted screenplay and directed the film, like contemplated abandoning the project, um, but decided like that he should make it out of uh, out of respect and you know in memoriam for O'Brien's yeah. story and, and whatnot. But that's not um, the the that's awful and like really just I don't know what happened in that scenario that two weeks after that, that happened. But the Rolex that um, uh, Nicholas Cage wears in the film that he sells. Um, is actually John O'Brien's watch. It's his actual watch. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there you, there go. you go. Cool. I must say, when you when you talk about that, it reminds me a lot. Have you? Do you know the movie um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? No. It's this film with Johnny Depp and some. I want to say Benicio del Toro, like like really young, like early nineties versions of these actors. Um, it was about the early nineties, and the movie is a biography on Hunter S. Thompson, the journalist, and it's about him going to Vegas and like. Very similar to this, but instead of like alcohol, it's drugs. And um and 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 actually, that, these movies have a lot in common because that also was based off um a biography that he wrote, *Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas*. Um, right. but Hunter S. Thompson thankfully didn't die before this movie. Um, uh, you know when this movie came into production. So, um, if you watch this movie, and this is just fact to remind me of it, if you watch *Leaving Las Vegas* and you really love it, watch *Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas*. It's like a more um, messed up version of it. Yeah. One last fact that I also had um, was that um, regarding the alcohol in this movie, liquor companies didn't actually want to be associated with the film, Brenton, because because they're like, we don't want to see Nicholas Cage turning like this because of us. So <laughs> so there was one beer company that actually gave the producers free beer to have them not put the label on the film. <laughs> That's incredible. Gosh. I know. I That's know. incredible. Wow. Isn't that amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So that's how the movie that's how the movie was made, Brenton. Yeah. Um not too many facts this week for that one just because there there wasn't as many unfortunately, but yeah. um I feel the ones we had actually were pretty meaty and interesting though, so that's that's always fun. Yeah. Now Nathan, I believe you wanted to Mate, I want I love new segments, you know. I'm, I'm yeah. all about the new segments and just for this episode, I'll, when we do a movie that that is such a landmark performance for an actor, I actually wouldn't mind looking at a little bit of his, of his filmography to see how it holds up. So I call this um I call this letting Nicholas out of the cage. That's that's what this segment is. And uh, this is where I want to talk about Nick Cage movies and know your thoughts on them, Rented, and see how Las Vegas compares to the other ones. Let's do it. So I've written down a couple of the Nick Cage movies I've seen. I just want to know how this movie compares to the other ones. So so I don't want to rank them. I just want to know what you think of this one compared to the others. So so National Treasure. Have you seen National Treasure 1 and 2? Haven't, haven't seen it. Haven't seen what? Either. What is wrong with you? They're such good movies. They're so underrated. It's so good. It's like Da Vinci Code, but for kids. It's so good. Isn't it like Da Vinci Code meets like Indiana Jones or something like that? Like it's yes, quite... and that and does that not sound remarkable? Yeah, it sounds awesome. Um, it's I don't know so why good. I haven't watched those movies actually. And he's also that not Nicolas Cage in it. Like he's very like low key Nicolas Cage. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and there's one scene where he where he famously um steals the Constitution of the United States, and it's incredible. I have to watch it. <laughs> it's so good. <gasps> It will be almost twenty years old. We should definitely do it if it does get older than that. So I reckon. Sure, sure. That, 
he's pretty good in that. Have you seen the Ghost Rider movies? No. Brenton, you're, you're bloody not Nick Cage, are you? No, I, like, great. I'm looking at this list. I've seen I've seen one film in, in its entirety. All right, what have you seen on this list? Let's talk about list. that. Kick-Ass. Oh, what do you think of Nick I've Cage seen. and Kick-Ass compared to here? Oh, well, obviously, they're two very different performances. <laughs> but I think it's are they, though? Like... I think, like, it's... I th- like you know, he's a very like in Kick Ass he plays a he plays this again daddy, a really fucked say. up character that's like yeah Big Daddy that's like fucking teaching his he daughter raises he's his daughter like, to be an assassin uh, <laughs> like his nine year old kid to be an assassin like and he's like got this like weird um, story of like because he's trying to avenge his wife's death I'm pretty sure but he's yeah. like he's taken it to like a next level and he's become this controlling. Uh, like tyrant basically in this house that's like raising his daughter in a way that just no sh- kid should be raised. So it's like it's a really cool character and it's a great again performance. very so, yeah. biographical on Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I've also seen some clips from uh, Spider Man into the Spider Verse, but oh, I haven't. This seen is the a lot best the, Nick Cage performance he's ever done. <laughs> I like, haven't seen like, a lot of the scenes that he's featured in, though, so I can't talk about it. He's really. so good. So in this movie, Spider Man into the Spider Verse came out late last year. It's it's about it's an animated Spider Man film, and in it, like, there's all these different versions of Spider Man, and like, and Nick plays Spider Man Noir, which is like a 1930s like detective version of Spider-Man and it is the funniest and most self-aware you'll ever see Nick Cage like he's so good like oh have you and speaking of best have you best have you also seen the worst Nick Cage movie which is is it that famous one with him and the bees yeah so that is um uh the Wicker Man um yes which I have seen I have seen have you really and what's that movie like yeah dude fucking hell like is it worth the watch dude like I feel it's early 2000s but it's it's worth a watch, like, regardless Ooh, of whether baby. we, like, have, we're not going to wait that long for it to be on the podcast, but m- you and me, we're going to sit down and watch it, because <laughs> it is I've seen fucking, the B scene, but I haven't seen the whole movie. It's fucking crazy, dude. It's like, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, is has, it like it has Nick to be Cage seen to be believed. Is it crazy, or is it crazier? It's nuts. Like, it's, it's actually bonkers that someone wrote that screenplay and was like, this makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the performance his performance as well like it's 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 amazing it's genuinely amazing it's it's so it's one of those things that's so bad that it's good like oh it's incredible there's there's a scene i'm really oh i don't want to spoil it for you oh we'll we'll talk about it when we've seen it we'll do it oh my god it's so funny (laughs) (laughs) the only other good movie that i've seen nick cage in is one called adaption which was written by charlie kaufman and and i haven't um, seen it it's really good. It's not that memorable. I watched it a couple of years back, and I'm like, "This is fine. It's good, but it's fine." Um, it's it's about it's, but it's got the best screenplay you you might ever see in cinema. It's about um, it's very very meta. Have you seen Charlie Kaufman's work? Have you seen like being John Malkovich? No, I haven't. I, I oh, haven't. mate, I've, you got to. I've see missed that out movie. on a lot of his work, unfortunately, and um, I really want to watch those films. Yeah, Why, so you like I'll have to give it something like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I I have to give adaptation a watch because um I've always wanted to see being John Malkovich as well. It's oh, just so good. Is yeah. that over twenty years? I'm not sure. I Actually, it must be. Maybe we'll find out. Oh, that's such a good movie. I love being John Malkovich. Fuck, it's so weird. It's so good. Um, I've, there's another one called like Vampire's Kiss or something that he's in that I've seen. Oh yeah. And that's that's got perhaps the you know Nicolas Cage gave a really good monologue in this movie, but this that movie has probably one of the greatest monologue ever put to screen. Um, and it features the alphabet. That's all Ooh, I'll say. Okay. It's, it is... <laughs> it's... I must say, talking about these movies, I know a lot of people today shit on Nick Cage, but I must say he does make fun choices. He does. He does. Have you seen that College Humor video where it's like where it's like Nicolas Cage saying yes to every movie? No, I haven't. That sounds oh, funny, though. Go on YouTube, listeners, and just type in Nick Cage College Humor. A college humor, and it's great. You, there's like a good skit they do where it's like he says yes to every movie, and the movies just get progressively more outlandish in their pitches. It's great. That's fun. Uh, hey, 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 Nathan. Yes. Hey. Should we let's look at this film? Let's look at this film's poster. <laughs> Were you just doing a Nick Cage impression then? <laughs> Maybe. Gosh. No, Brendan. It wasn't, stay off it wasn't, the bottle. It wasn't the intentional podcast. at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um. This poster, Brenton, I'm not a big fan of for a couple of reasons. Most prominently, I think it's very misleading because yeah, it looks I agree. so jolly. It's 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 this it's this like it looks like a literal frame from the movie. It's like this big black poster with this like frame in the center of it of Nick Cage and um and Mrs. Shu walking down the street, all joy joy and and happy. And then the rest of the poster is just like quotes from like newspapers. And I've always just liked that in posters that you have to like 
slap it with reviews to sell a movie? Look, for me, I agree. I think this this poster is very misleading. Um, mm. Obviously, I appreciate that it's got the two leading characters, which I think should be on the poster regardless. But mm. again, it's this misleading kind of shot of... Um, it looks like, like a scene from When Harry Met Sally. Like it's, it's, it does. It's not, like, it's not... It's not leaving Las Vegas. It's like trying to set up again this kind of rom-com vibe, and it's just like, no, that's not what this film is at all. Um, mm. So it, my my suggestion in fixing it is that it need it, it it's as simple as I think, like just like the two characters' faces, basically, like maybe they're like in an embrace or something, and they're like looking out towards something that we can't see, and they both look very forlorn, like something like that. That's just mm. simple. It, like it doesn't have to be anything crazy, and like maybe in the window in the background you see a casino or something. Like, mate, you just fixed that poster. Well done. I I completely agree with all that. Thanks, dude. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, pat on the back to you, Brenton. Well done. Have a little have a little podcast cookie. I'll have a glass of milk and a cookie. Yay. <laughs> our, our podcast cookies actually have my face on them, but like, but it's me pulling a Nicolas Cage grin. Yep. So I chomp that shit down. <laughs> Well, maybe we should pass it to the people, Brenton. Power, power to the people. Let's pass it to the people, the power. Pass it to the people. All right, run into Maddows. They bloody love this film, Brenton. They're giving it 90% from the critics, and from the audience, gave it an 85%. Mate, they're spot on. They're Good bloody work. getting around it, including the words from Candice Frederick from Real Talk Online, who gave it a B plus, Brenton, and said, this movie was like watching a car crash in slow motion. <laughs> you know there was going to be a crash, but I wished it would or- just happen already and not have spent two hours getting to the impact. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah, like, I think I think that's a good point. <laughs> I Like, I, I think that's a good point, but for me, like, it goes for about an hour 45, and I feel hmm. like... I feel like it was still, like, in terms of runtime, it was fine. I didn't feel like it was that long. No, no, same. But I think it's what it's referring to is the thing you were saying is that there's not much plot. There's not many plot points. Mm. It's all, yeah, it's all about the the character development and building. It's and all about the, character. And, you know, like, <laughs> we just want to tell a story about character. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Roger Ebert from the Chicago Sun-Times, who the I Roger mentioned Ebert. before, um says, uh, gave it a positive review, four out of four, uh, which is a bit weird. I don't know why that's four out of four. Anyway, Cage, a resourceful and daring actor, has never been better. Oh, uh, I bet he... Well, he wrote this in on New Year's Day of January 2000, which is kind of funny that after 1999 New Year's Day, after that huge party changing the millennium, Roger Ebert decided to write a review for Bloody Leaving Las Vegas. <laughs> I love that. I think I think it's funny because you said that the greatest Nicolas Cage performance is Spider Man into the Spider Verse. So, um, so you know, so Roger never saw Nick's great days. <laughs> I, I know exactly, exactly. So, um, uh, before before Spider Verse came out, this was his best performance. But you say afterwards, it's Spider Verse all the way. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm anonymous. Gave it five stars and wrote the best romance movie ever made. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> as Bo- as Borat says. Not. <laughs> As bloody Palpatine says, no, no. <laughs> Kevin H gives it four and a half stars. <laughs> a good example of how Nick Cage is more than an internet punchline. He's drunk at the end of the rope comes closer to reality than any other alcoholic I've ever seen on screen. He's up there. like He is up there. He's not like Johnny Um, Depp drunk, is he? He's not like fun, like Pirates of the Caribbean drunk. No, he's he's, a... He's real drinking to death. Drinking yourself to death drunk. He's a little bit like a Jessica Jones drunk. Have you seen that show? No, sorry. (laughs) Could you, like, watch film and television for once, Brenton? Like... (laughs) Okay. I'm so sorry, sir. I'm just too busy going outdoors and smelling the fresh air. <laughs> Stay inside and watch content. <laughs> uh, Terry H gave it five stars and said, Really enjoyed snuggling slash cuddling next to my hubby and watching this great movie. Terry H, no one needs to know that. And <laughs> you, well, well, like, uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to imagine like snu- if like snuggling up to my future partner and just being like, oh, this movie just warms the bloody heart. Uh, like, <laughs> I don't but know really, that kind of movie. You gave it five stars, and fifty percent of the reason you gave it five stars was because you were enjoying a snuggle from your husband that had nothing to actually do with what was happening on the screen. <laughs> I don't think snuggling next to my wife would make Land Before Time better. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, worse. 
Uh, uh. Juan Alvaro Linko um, says, I'm alcoholic and I really appreciated this movie. Non-judgmental film for me. Kudos. Oh, well... Yeah, and, I think and it's you know a good what? Point. I really love the movie for that. I really love it didn't say, this alcoholic, what a menace to society. It was just like, yeah. here's a man with a really serious medical issue and let's treat it with severity. I really love that. I really try. I didn't try to demonize Nicolas Cage for the choice he made of being an alcoholic. Totally agree, yeah. yeah. And lastly, Patrick Bateman from Apparently American Psycho <laughs> wrote, I often get drunk watching this movie. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> One, if if bloody Christian Bell wrote that, that's amazing. But two, this is one of those movies you really can't drink to. It's like bloody... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I demonstrated that when I said before about the wine, but yeah, it's... Uh... Oh, it ain't no Rocky Four, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah. Live in Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. I'm really glad we talked about this movie. And I, yeah, and I I'm surprised. I, I thought we would be more like going, oh, God, like, <laughs> just... Just, we need something joyful after this, Brenton. Like I don't know. We need like, we need to cleanse our palate next week with this um with a way more fun movie. We I just yeah. I need to do something fun. Like after bloody Babe of just rolling my eyes at it and bloody doing Vegas where I'm just like depressed. Let's do a fun like like action movie next week. That's what I want. Yeah, buddy. I'm down for that. I'm down for that all the way. All right. Well, well, thank you for listening. Um, you know where to find us. It's on the internet. You can communicate to us via a host of mediums, including but not limited to Twitter or email. And please write to us. We bloody love it you know we print every email and we frame it on our wall or at least brenton does you know he's 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 into that kind of stuff yeah i've got many frames i've got frames of everything (laughs) even the spam email he decides to print and frame you know he's into his bloody framing business i love it it gives me joy (laughs) <laughs> but you know what else gives me joy this podcast Brenton thank you for a great oh, ah, you, you for brought it around ah. <laughs> uh, but seriously g- shut the fuck up pack up your shit and get out of this motel and your band take your drunk ass out I am closing the door <laughs> <laughs>